Hi, I'm Reverend Amy. Thanks for joining us. Today's scripture includes John 3.16, a very well-known verse. It is interesting that this comes from a conversation that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. It's a conversation that happened at night, a glimmer of light nurtured by the depths of the night. We are emerging from a season of darkness as we watch the light grow and the days lengthen. We've seen bees buzzing and snow melting. These are natural, beautiful reminders that God's love is all around us. So let's take a deep breath, center ourselves, and prepare to worship God together. Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before the year started, before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry, before we figured out who we really are, before we figured out who we want to be, before it all, God loved us unconditionally and freely, fully and honestly, God loved us again and again. This is where our story begins. Let us worship God. Jesus, Savior, Lord, love to Thee, I fly, Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Thou the rock, my refuge, that's higher than I, Saranam, Saranam, Saranam. Saranam. 
God of love, we forget the beginning of the story, that we were made from love, to be love, to give love. Instead of rooting our narrative in the goodness refrain of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth at the fall, with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there was you, and you are love. We forget that out of that love you created us. We forget that from the very first day you loved first. We forget because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves. Forgive our hesitation to trust that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to pass that doubt on from generation to generation. Write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray again and again. Amen. Hear these words of assurance. Family of faith, no matter what we do, where we go, or what we tell ourselves, God is love and God is loving us. Again and again, you are claimed, held, forgiven, and cared for in the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself. Thanks be to God. Amen. Welcome. I'm so glad to see you today, and I'm so glad you could join me and Lacey for the fourth week of Lent and the week of St. Patrick's Day. This week, I have been thinking about love. There are so many examples of love, like maybe your mom packing your lunch, or your dad reading you a book before you go to bed. Oh, there's so many uh, uh, examples. This week, I thought I would tell you about the love of a special dog named Sadie from New Jersey. And Lacey came here to help me tell this story because like Sadie, Lacey is a rescue dog who was abandoned and later found her forever home with our family. Let me tell you a little bit about Sadie. Thanks to the Bergen Ramapo Animal Refuge Facebook page, we can see a picture of Sadie. She's a six-year-old German Shepherd who sadly was abandoned by her original family who could no longer care for her. And because Sadie was a, what they called aggressive, she was moved from animal shelter to animal shelter looking for a forever home. Luckily, last October, Sadie was adopted. Thanks to Brian Myers of Teaneck, New Jersey, who read about Sadie, he decided to give her a chance. What had been happening was when Sadie would meet a potential new owner, she got very aggressive. She would build herself up to the biggest she could and snarl and growl and act aggressive towards them. But when Mr. Myers went to visit her, within minutes they were playing fetch. And in fact, it was love at first sight. That day, Mr. Myers took Sadie home. And what's funny is, on the way home, he stopped to get her some treats and a big bag of dog food and her very own bed. But when he got home, Guess where Sadie decided to sleep? Right in bed with him. Well, it turns out that was a good thing because this February, Mr. Meyer got very sick 
and in the middle of the night he had a stroke which means his body was not acting the way he in a way he could control and he fell to the floor and he was far away from his telephone. He couldn't call for help. He lived alone with Sadie, and clearly she doesn't use the telephone. Can you use the telephone, Lacey? Do you know how to dial 911? Well, neither did Sadie. So, thankfully, Sadie got very nervous and ran over to Brian and tried to nudge him around along. Eventually, he realized by holding on to her collar, she was so strong that she could pull him around, and eventually she pulled him close enough to his phone that he could reach it and call 911. She saved his life. When they reunited three weeks later, they were both ecstatic. Sadie used her strength to help her owner, and now they have been reunited at home again in New Jersey. If you Google Sadie and Brian Myers, you will find dozens of articles about him. They've been on TV, they've been in newspapers all across the country because their love story was so important. Can you imagine how strong God's love is? Could you imagine? We did nothing to earn God's love and it's there all the time. If Sadie and Brian can love each other this much, can you imagine what God's love can do for us? It's kind of exciting, isn't it? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for loving me from the very beginning. Help me start with love in everything I do and say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before I leave you today, I want to read you um, the St. Patrick's Breastplate Prayer. That's a really special prayer that you can use this week and all times when you need a little help. Christ be with me, Christ within me, Christ behind me, Christ before me, Christ beside me, Christ to win me, Christ to comfort me and restore me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me, Christ in quiet, Christ in danger, Christ in hearts of all that love me, Christ in mouth of friend or stranger. As you celebrate St. Patrick's Day this week, it's on um, March 17th, you can um, also Google his prayers. There's a lot of prayers, and this one is was specifically called the Breastplate Prayer. We hope you have a wonderful week. And for Sunday School, why don't you talk to your family about different acts of love? There's so many acts of love and things we do for each other. See what you can share with each other. And finally, there's a special book called Love. It's written by Matt. Matt De La Pena, and you can Google that on um, and hear a read along on YouTube. That's a great book to give you other ideas of special love. Thanks for being with us today. Lacey says thank you too. Have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday. Bye. Today's gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 3 verses 14 through 21. Listen now for word and wisdom. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Words to bring God nearer for the word of God in Jesus for God's wisdom all around us, for God's word and wisdom in us. Thanks be to God.
Today's scripture reading is kind of like coming in on the tail end of a conversation. You think you know what is going on, but you're missing some important parts. Previously, Jesus has been talking with Nicodemus, a teacher and leader of the Jewish people. Nicodemus has come to Jesus with spiritual questions, and he and Jesus are discussing them at night. My mother has always advised against having important discussions at night. Everything always looks worse at night, she says. There may be something to that. Psalm 30 says, Weeping may linger for the night, but joy comes with the morning. But let's think a little more about night. Night, darkness, is a good thing. We can't have light all of the time. We need darkness to sleep, to restore, to rejuvenate. Seeds need the darkness in the surrounding earth to germinate. Nicodemus might have needed the cover of darkness to help him talk with Jesus. Perhaps he didn't want to broadcast that he was talking with Jesus, a leader with ideas that were upsetting the status quo that he was a part of. Maybe he wasn't ready yet. We do know that Nicodemus appears again in John's Gospel. After Jesus was crucified, Nicodemus brings spices and aloe to anoint Jesus' body for burial. He and Joseph of Arimathea lay Jesus' body in the tomb. So there must have been something about Jesus and his teaching that touched Nicodemus' soul. We are fortunate to have their conversation to ponder. The next part of their conversation, and the first part of today's scripture, is a curious one to hear. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. When the Israelites were in the wilderness with Moses, during their journey they complained about the miraculous sustenance that was being delivered to them daily. God, in a well-known and well-practiced parental move, the old, are you complaining? I'll give you something to complain about. God sends poisonous serpents to bite them, and many people die. The complainers see the folly of their complaints and go to Moses confessing that they have sinned against God. They know it now. And, uh, Moses, can't you get God to take away the serpents? So God and Moses work it out. The serpents stay but Moses is told by God to put a poisonous snake on a stick. When the people are bit, you look up to the serpent and live. I'm guessing that there are people who said, or rather who complained, what is it with this snake on a stick? If you just got rid of the serpents, we wouldn't have to bother with this looking up and living stuff. You could streamline this whole process. Wouldn't it be wonderful to take away all of the bad stuff in life that slithers around undetected, that startles us, then bites our ankles, poisoning and killing us? Wouldn't that be paradise? Yes, it would. It certainly wouldn't be life as we know it. And if you remember, paradise had a snake too. The talking serpent in the Garden of Eden the one who knew just how delicious apples and knowledge are. I feel the pain of the Israelites. Just get rid of the snakes. Can't something, anything be easy? Please, especially now, my pandemic patience is just gone. We have suffered long enough. Just get rid of the snakes. Didn't St. Patrick do that for Ireland, drive out the snakes? Surely God could do that for us, too. It seems like a reasonable request well within the scope of God's job description. Especially when we read on and hear John 3.16, For God to love the world. And verse 17 speaks of Jesus being sent not to condemn but to save. There is this tremendous love that undergirds everything. It is the source of our being, of all being. God loves first, first, and foremost. Wouldn't making things a little bit easier on us be the loving thing for God to do? I don't really have an answer for that, but I do know that that isn't how things are in the world. 
We have a lot in the world that needs to be healed, from the earth itself, to our communities, to our very own selves, our body and soul. Do we look up to live? When we look up, do we see a healing bronze serpent on a staff? Do we see Jesus lifted up on a cross or lifted up in new resurrection life? Do we even look up? Do we even bother to? Or are our heads bowed down so low that we can't even look up? There is something about seeing and healing. There is something about looking at our problems and not looking away. There is something about being curious about our pain and struggles, examining them and staying with them, not running away. Usually when we run away from our problems, they eventually find us again. The old you can run, but you can't hide thing. Let's look at that symbol of the snake again. It's a really old symbol that has been with humanity for a very long time. We've already thought back to the snake in the garden. We often think of being afraid of snakes or snakes being a sign of evil. But the snake is a two-sided symbol. Snakes have long been associated with regeneration and healing. Think of how a snake sheds its skin. The ancients saw that as a sign of new life. Many of our medical symbols have the rod of Asclepius on them. In Greek mythology, Asclepius was the son of the sun god Apollo, and he's associated with snakes. Asclepius carries a staff with a snake wound around it. Asclepius was a healer and known to have the ability to bring people back to life. There is a story of snakes licking his ears clean and giving him healing knowledge. In another story of snakes bringing a special herb with resurrecting powers. In gratitude to these creatures, Asclepius carried a staff with a snake. Snakes have gotten a bad reputation in Christianity with the Adam and Eve in the garden story. But there is something so compelling about these snakes and their involvement with healing. These snakes being lifted up. And then when we continue on with the symbol of Jesus being lifted up. Many followers of Jesus have meditated on the crucifixion and found that to be a healing image by sharing suffering with Jesus together. Is there something about taking the parts of us that are animalistic? that slither on the ground unnoticed? Is there something about lifting them up and acknowledging them that's healing? We all have parts of ourselves that seem to have a life of their own. Parts of ourselves that we feel embarrassment or shame about. The parts we'd like to have down there out of sight. Let's just look up and keep going forward like they don't exist. But there they are. They are there. We can't go through life living as if at the tip of the iceberg, disconnected, living all in our head, thinking that we are controlling and orchestrating life. But the animals and instincts have their say, even in us. Life is healthier. We are healthier if we can acknowledge what is going on. If we don't, we're going to step on a nest of snakes and get bit, bit and sick from the venom. But if we look at those impulses and desires, those temptations even, we have a better chance of being able to decide how we want to react instead of them reacting through us. It's easier to do, decide what to do with a snake up on a stick than one unseen in the grass. Richard Rohr is a gifted Franciscan friar and writer who lives in New Mexico. He writes, Jesus' suffering on the cross was a correct diagnosis and revelation of the human dilemma. It was an invitation to enter into solidarity with the pain of the world and our own pain, instead of always resisting it, avoiding it, or denying it. Lady Julian of Norwich, my favorite Christian mystic, understood it so well, and she taught, in effect, that there is only one suffering, and we all share in it. 
there is vulnerability in being seen. There is vulnerability in living in a body and being alive, and at some point we all suffer. But we suffer together. We can try to be open to the sufferings of our siblings on this earth. By doing so, we share in the suffering of Jesus, the earth, and indeed of God. We enter into this communal experience of true life lived together. When we do that, we are held together by God's love and light. Darkness and night are part of this love and light. We can't be separated from it. And why would we want to be? It is part of the whole, and God is in it too. Psalm 139 tells us that even the darkness is not dark to you, O God. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. The darkness is a fertile place. Let us not be afraid of it. Out of this place springs our healing, springs our wholeness. May we have the courage to look, look down, look up, to look at each other, to look to each other. May we have the courage not only to believe, but to act and live life out of God's love that was there first. One of the passages in the Bible that resonated with the enslaved Africans and their descendants in North America was the painful experience of the exile. The Jewish people were forced to live in a far-off land. They wondered what they had done to deserve this misery. In the eighth chapter of the book of Jeremiah, the prophet asks, Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician here? Why, then, has the health of my poor people not been restored? There is a balm, and Gilead is a treasured hymn, a treasured spiritual born out of the brutal experience of slavery. The refrain of the spiritual offers encouragement and dares to respond with hope in the face of hopelessness, showing courage in the face of despair. African-American theologian Howard Thurman discusses the refrain of the spiritual. The slave caught the mood of the spiritual dilemma and with it did an amazing thing. He straightened the question mark in Jeremiah's sentence into an exclamation point. There is a bomb in Gilead. Here is the note of creative triumph. When we live our lives out of God's love, that God loved first, we are called to live out of creative triumph. We can bend the question marks into exclamation points. We can find light in the darkness. We too can love because God loves first. Before we act, think, or believe, can love be first for us too. May it be so. Amen. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a palm in Gilead to make a wounded whole. There is a palm sin a sick soul. Don't ever feel discouraged, for Jesus is your friend. And if you look for knowledge, he'll never refuse to lend. There is a bomb in Gilead to make Oh,
to heal the sin sick Did you know, when you donate to the UMCOR Sunday offering, you support long-term sustainable development, U.S. and international disaster relief, global migration, and global health. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to respond with extravagant grace. Through the United Methodist Committee on Relief, we are able to make a difference in the lives of communities and individuals whose lives have been upset by storms, wars, fires, displacement, and climate change. This offering underwrites UMCOR's costs of doing business, allowing UMCOR to keep the promise that 100% of any gift to a specific UMCOR project will go toward that project, not administrative costs. UMCOR specializes in solutions that help people become self-reliant. Help us be a source of help and hope for those in need. Your gift helps UMCOR stay until recovery is complete. Give in person, by mail, or online at umc.org ssgive. Almighty God, we give thanks to you for your steadfast love that endures forever. With grateful hearts, we follow Jesus, your Son, whom by your immense and abiding love for us, you sent so that the world might be saved. We know that there is no pain that you have not felt, no grief or longing that we cannot share with you. With the confidence of your fellowship, we pray to you for all the long days and the lonely nights, the unmet dreams, the cries in the wilderness, the inconsolable pain, the half goodbyes, the relationships without resolve, the truths left unsaid, the sighs and tears that words cannot express. When we feel alone, God, remind us of your presence when we feel broken, God, remind us of all that you have made whole. Remind us, God, again and again, that you loved us first. And help us, God, to hold on with resolve and joyful hearts. Hear these and all our prayers this day. In Jesus' name, we continue to pray, praying the prayer that he taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I want to walk as a child of I want to see
peace of Christ. Look upon yourself and the world with the eyes of compassion, with the eyes of God who so loves the world, who so loves you. Before we act, think, or believe, let us love first, just as we are loved by the one who holds us in the palm of his hand. Go in peace. Amen. May the road rise to meet you, may the wind be always at your back, may the sun shine warm upon your face, Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again next time. Until then, may we notice all of the reminders of God's hope all around us. Out of darkness comes light. At one point during the winter, I wondered if this giant pile of snow would be with us until August. We are making progress. Yes, we are in many ways. Keep up the good work and keep looking for signs of hope. See you here next week.